I'm so glad to be with you all today as we continue our series, This Is Who We Are. For those, if it's your first time today and you might not know what we're busy talking about, we're talking about the values of Grace Church, and I hope that it will mean something to you today, whether you're a follower of Jesus or not. I think in today's message specifically, you will hear why uh, many of us, us choose to follow Jesus and what difference it makes in our life. But why values? When you walk through the door of a church, when you walk through a door of any organization, there is a vibe, there's a feel to a place. And that vibe is created by the culture of any organization of, or a church. So two churches might have the same vision, but they feel different. And we believe that God has called us and positioned us uniquely for a family feel church. That's what we really want, because that is how I believe the Bible describes the Christian church. And our values shape the culture that shapes that feel. So we are busy with this, and we've already covered four of them. You can catch up on Spotify, on um, podcasting platforms, iTunes, anywhere you like, if you want to catch up on the previous four. But today, as we jump into number five, I just thought about how Each and every person in this room probably has an issue with people who say one thing and do another. Like, it's it's like a universal trait that we all have. Like, even if you are maybe that person, you still have an issue if someone else says one thing and do another. They say they're going to be on time, then they're late, right? Or they say they're going to help you um, fix your car, and then they never show up. Whatever it might be. We even created words for that, right? Whether it's a a person that's just a friend, whether it's a political leader who says something and they do something else, whether it is a teacher at school that says this is the school rules, but they do the opposite, whether it's a pastor that preaches something and then lives a different way, or whether it's a parent and your parent keeps telling you what you have to do, but then they live the opposite. Like we have words for that. We call them hypocrites. We call it people with double standards. We call it a no count, right? Someone that you cannot count on them. We call them people that talk the talk, but they don't walk the walk. We don't like it. And it's interesting that Jesus also had a very big issue with people that listened to him and that talked the talk, but they didn't walk the walk. And today, that is how we jump into the fifth value that we have at Grace Church. And our fifth value is we are doers of the word. We are doers of the word. Now, we're going to read today... A piece from Matthew 7, but I have to give you a bit of background. Jesus preaches the biggest sermon he ever preached while he was on earth. You find it in Matthew 5, you find it in Matthew 6 and 7, and it covers almost any topic you can think of. But as Jesus starts to land this plane in the sermon, he starts to cover a couple of specific things where he contrasts two things to each other. So he talks about the, na- the narrow and the wide gate. It says, few people will be on the narrow gate that leads to heaven. A lot of people will be on the, um, go through the wide gate that doesn't lead to heaven, that leads to hell. He talks about true and false prophets. How people say they follow God, but their life bears no fruit. And he actually says, hey, if you bear no fruit, I'm going to cut you down. Like, that's some pretty hard words. And then he talks about true and false disciples. So people, a disciple is someone who follows Jesus, right? And finally, after he's done this, he concludes his whole sermon. Now, if you've ever done any form of public speaking, you will know that the intro and the ending is probably the two most important parts. The the middle, people kind of get some of it, some of it they miss. But the beginning and the end, people normally get. So Jesus decides to end his sermon with these words that we're going to read today. Matthew 7 is going to be on the screen if you've got your Bibles with you. It's the first book in the New Testament Um, that talks about the life of Jesus, Matthew 7, verse 24 to verse 27. Jesus says, Therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine 
and puts them into practice is like a wise man who built his house on the rock. The rain came down, the streams rose, and the winds blew and beat against the house, yet it did not fall because it had its foundations on the rock. But everyone who hears these words of mine and does not put them into practice is like a foolish man who built his house on sand. The rain came down, the streams rose, the winds blew and beat against the house, and it fell with a great crash. Jesus illustrates a very important point to us by using an illustration of builders. And I want to actually illustrate something of that to you today, and when he's going to bring me some um, tools to help do that. But why did Jesus use builders? I think for a very important reason. Whether you know it or not, each and every one of us, every single day of our ha- lives, are building our life houses. The lives that we build are made up of little decisions that we make every day, and I think we sometimes forget it. So Jesus uses this illustration, and basically what, what he's saying is that our life is not a bunch of disconnected little events, disconnected decisions, disconnected ambitions that just kind of do what they want. Each and every decision that we make in life is a little brick that we build into a house that at the end of the day does not only house me, but my family and everyone that's in touch with me, right? My life house. And here are some of the bricks that we often build with. The ambitions that you cherish so much. That's a brick that you build into your life house. Every thought that you've ever conceived, Everything that you think of, everything that that pops into your head that you allow to grow, that is a brick that you use to build your life house with. Every decision that you've ever made to act on a thought, to act on an impulse, to do something, to um, speak to someone in a certain way, whatever it might be, every decision we make is a brick that we use to build a house. Every word that you've ever spoken to someone is a brick that we build into our life house. Every deed that you ever performed is a brick that you build into a life house. And finally, through all of these little things, it sometimes seems disconnected, gradually a structure of our lives rise up. Life is not a bunch of disconnected actions, but building blocks in the bigger picture of who you are becoming. And I think Jesus uses this illustration of a builder to bring something home to us, that everything that we do is a building block that's building a structure of our lives. But when Jesus talks about the builders, he says that all builders aren't exactly the same, right? They build differently. There was one foolish builder and there was one wise builder. And it is interesting that the materials they used are not discussed. Only one thing is discussed and that is the foundation of their house. Because what we know is that it doesn't matter what material you use in your house. If your foundation isn't solid, the house will not stand. Right, in Canada, this is something I had to learn. We don't have this in South Africa. You can use whatever material you want, but if your foundation isn't below the frost line or if it's not anchored on the Canadian shield, your house will move. I look at your houses, I'm like, it's literally built of paper, right? Like these little paper walls. Like ours is built of brick. But we build our houses with brick in South Africa, and my parents used to live on our east coast, and there was this massive storm and like mini tsunamis, and it would take a whole side of basically a sand dune that these houses are built on, and it would just take it away. You just see the whole house go like a little toy thing, gone into the ocean. So whether it's built of drywall, whether it's built of brick, whether it's built of stone, the material doesn't matter as much as the foundation. Let me give you an illustration. Often, when I speak to people with some marriage problems or I'm preparing people for for their wedding day, people often ask, like, what is the most important elements, the most important building bricks for my marriage? And you can go and read books about this. You can find information in all kinds of places, and some might say, oh, it's communication. Some might say, oh, no, it's just never go to bed angry. Some might say, oh, it is just to always tell the truth. Here is the problem. You can find and poke holes in all of those things somewhere or another. 
Is it fine to just be truthful when you're having an, an affair? Is it fine to never go to bed angry after you've stabbed each other a couple of times with a knife? Right? It doesn't, you need something that goes deeper than just the building block. That changes us in our very core and not just the little behaviors that we have. And David knew something of this as well. David, one of the greatest kings of Israel that established the kingdom of the original kingdom of Israel in Psalm 127 says, unless the Lord builds a house, the work of the builders is wasted. He said, listen, we can build the most magnificent structures. We can use whatever building bricks we believe, whatever advice we get from all kinds of social medias and people and books and things. But if God is not involved in building the foundations of our life, if God is not essentially woven into the fabrics of our lives, it is wasted time. See, foundations are everything. These two builders had a lot of things in common. Both of the people Jesus speak about heard his words. Both of them build a house. Both of them probably use decent materials. But there was one big difference between the two builders. The one builder had foresight. You see, the one builder looked at the terrain and he saw some sand and maybe dug a little deeper and he saw some gravel and, and he's like, this is pretty okay. It's a desert. It's dry, right? There's no rain. There's no storms coming. I can probably build my house on this and it will survive for a couple of years. But the one with foresight realized then that that is not enough because at some point, even if it's in 100 years, a flood will come. So he dug a little deeper through the gravel onto the solid foundation and he started building his house on that because he had the foresight that whatever seems like a dry riverbed now will one day be flooded. The other man, without the foresight, he just decided, well, the sand looks as good as anything, so let me just build my house straight on top of that. And he never realized, and he didn't see that there will be a day when a storm would hit his house. And it is so cool to me when I read this, that Jesus speaks of two builders, not three, not four, and not five. Jesus doesn't say, say there's one kind of builder that builds on the rock. There's one kind of builder that builds on the gravel. There's one that builds on the sand. Then there's one who builds on the rock, but with like really bad material. Jesus doesn't go like that. He's like, there's two kinds of builders. That's it. There's one that builds on the right foundations and one that builds on the wrong foundations. And building our lives on the rock of Jesus means not only listening to Jesus, but putting his commands into practice. You get two kinds of builders, you get two kinds of Christians. People who sit in the seats every Sunday, both of them here, but we decide to build our lives differently. One decides to build it on rock, the other decides to build it on sand. And what Jesus is telling us here is that he wants us not just to be hearers and not just to be, to be talking the talk, but to walk the walk, to be doers of his word. And maybe you're sitting here today and maybe this is your first time in church for in a very long time. Maybe you don't follow Jesus yet. Maybe you still have all kinds, all kinds of questions about faith. And you're like, Louis, my problem is that I've already built the house. But you say the foundation needs to be Jesus. And my foundation is not Jesus, so what now? The beauty of building is that if your foundation is wrong, you can always underpin a house. You can always dig deeper and lay a new foundation that helps your house to stand firm. So no matter who you are today, no matter how you grew up, no matter what you've believed, no matter where, on what foundation you have built, it is never too late to underpin your house on the rock. We can dig deeper and we can build on the right foundation. And that is exactly what we saw happen when we baptized a whole bunch of people here a couple of weeks ago. It's people who said, my foundation might not have been right, but I'm underpinning my house now on Jesus. And here's what it means. You might have some broken windows. You might have some drywall in your house with holes in it. You might have some shingles that blew off your roof. But listen, a house, the main, the main purpose of a house is not to look pretty. 
The main purpose of a house is to protect us from the elements. So it is okay if you've used some material in the past that doesn't look so good, that is messy, that is painful sometimes, but if your house is on the rock, it doesn't need to look perfect. Because at the end of the day, what truly matters is that there will be a day, Jesus said, that testing will come to both houses. No matter who we are, testing comes to us all and it cannot be prevented. The test of crisis is always coming, whether you live somewhere in Africa, whether you live <clears throat> in Canada, whether you live in third world, the first world, it doesn't matter. It might come through some kind of trial you have to go to, some kind of temptation, some kind of sickness that you're facing, some kind of death in the family. And at the end of the day, for all of us, our own death. And at the end of the day, the final judgment when Jesus returns, there is a testing that's coming to all of us, and we cannot avoid it. And here is the thing. This kind of testing always arrives suddenly. That's something that I've learned about storms here in Canada as well. Like there's nothing, it's beautiful outside, next moment trees are blowing over, and then it's just like clear skies again. I'm like, how does this happen so fast? Like we at least have some warning in South Africa, right? It, it takes some time to build up, but taste arrives with dramatic suddenness. And it, that storm will expose every bit of shoddy craftsmanship in your life house, every piece of inferior building material. The frost will expose the shallow foundations that have been laid in your life. But the benefit if, is that if we build on the rock of Jesus, Jesus said the storms can come, the water can flow around this house, and the winds can try to pull it apart, but the house will remain standing, not because of the material, but because of the foundation. What Jesus is saying, those who take to heart these words will never be put to shame, not even on judgment day. So our foundation in this life and our foundation for eternity, our hope for eternity, is not built in the, is not made up out of the materials that we use to build our lives' houses. It's not in our greatness or in our strength or in whatever we can do. It is built on Christ, on His foundation and Him alone. So let me ask you this. Have you ever thought about the fact that your reaction to the words of Jesus have eternal implications. Why is this a value? How does this affect our culture at grace? It seems like it's something more personal, right? We live in a world, especially in Canada, where Christianity is often viewed more and more as something that's hostile, something that's bad. And I believe a lot of that view, the way that, that people view the church, comes from a place where so many bad things have been done in the name of the church or in the name of Jesus in the past. We know all the stuff with the residential schools, right? And we're not a Catholic church. It doesn't matter. People still view us as the church. And I think one of the main reasons why the secular world has started to view Christians in such a hostile way is not just because we live in a spiritual war every day, but I believe it's because so many people claim to be doing things in the name of Jesus and in the name of the church, but it's the exact opposite to what Jesus asked us to do. They, are, they talk the talk, but they don't walk the walk. And this matters. This is a value because the world, New Market, York region is watching us and drawing conclusions not on what we say we believe, but on what we live every single day. The way you greet them when you drop off your kids at school, the way you make coffee when you're at work, the way you do your work, everything, the eyes are on us, and the world is saying, what do we see when we look at Christians? And James, the brother of Jesus, understood this when in James 2 verse 14, he wrote this. He said, what good is it, my brothers and sisters, if someone claims to have faith, but he has no deeds? 
Can such a faith save them? Suppose a brother or a sister is without clothes and daily food. If one of you says to them, go in peace, keep warm and well fed, but does nothing about their physical needs, what good is it? In the same way, faith by itself, if it is not accompanied by action, is dead. But someone will say, you have faith, I have deeds. Show me your faith without deeds, and I will show you my faith by my deeds. You believe that there is one God? Good. Even the demons believe that and shudder. You see, James is not saying that my faith and that eternity and my hope for eternity is built on my good deeds. It's not. But what he is saying is that when I truly believe in Jesus, if I'm truly a follower of Jesus, it's not just about saying that. It is about living it in the simple things like taking care of someone in need. You see, you believe in Jesus, you might say that. The demons also believed that he was the son of God. When Jesus appeared to the demons, they were the first ones to say, go away from us, son of God. When no one else even knew it, they knew. They know who he is. But they were afraid of him because they don't love him. They're not his followers. So it's not enough to say we love Jesus. It's not enough for the church. And if you're not part of the Christian church, this is an internal conversation, okay? If you are part of the church, it is not okay for you to sit here every Sunday and to wear a cross around your neck and to have a Bible on your bedside table. But tomorrow when you walk out your door, you live exactly like the rest of the world. That's not okay. That's what Jesus is saying. When we truly love him, we will represent him so well out of our love for him. We do good things not to earn his love. Good flows out of a loving relationship that I have with my Father in heaven. When we say something and don't follow it up by action, we leave other people with a bad impression of who the church is. And I believe that hearing the teaching of Jesus is regarded genuine, genuine, only when it's accompanied by doing what Jesus actually says. So being a disciple of Jesus is not just about doctrine. It's not just about theology. It's not just about knowledge. Knowledge is important. The Bible says that. But it's not just about that. It is about living a life that represents the doctrine that we believe. Our life and our lips need to be in harmony. And therefore at Grace Church, we choose to actively live out the truth of God's word in our daily lives. To be doers and not just hearers. We choose to be different. We don't want to be a church of spectators. We don't want to be a church of consumers. We spoke about that last week. We want to be a church that actively lives out our faith in Jesus, where His Word, not our opinions, not the opinion of the world, determines our identity, determines our choices, determines the way we live, determines the steps we take every day, determines the material that we use to build our life houses. Where our faith is not merely a tradition, or where it's not merely the thing that my parents brought me to on a Sunday, where it's not merely a knowledge base, but where it is who we are. So the church is not this building, the church is not a Sunday, the church is not an hour on a Sunday, the church is us meeting together in the name of Jesus, going out into the world and representing Him well. What Jesus is saying in this scripture is that he expects a righteousness that was greater than that of the religious leaders. A righteousness that was greater than that of the people who challenged him so often with all the right words. But his actions didn't back up what they said they believed. At grace, we choose to live different. Let's pray. Jesus, on behalf of myself and our church, 
I want to apologize for the many, many times that we've said we believe something and we live the opposite way. Or the times we said we believe something and we just didn't live it out at all. Thank you that we know we have forgiveness in you. I pray that you would give us the strength, that you would give us the wisdom to build the foundation of our lives on you. Not just the foundation of our knowledge, not just the foundation of our words, but the foundation of every action, every word spoken. The way we live as husbands to our wives and wives to our husbands, parents to our children, as children to our parents, the way we work, the way we go to school, the way we, believe, we, um, we act towards our friends, I pray that in everything, you will be the foundation to our lives. And I pray, Jesus, that as a church is not perfect, we don't always get it right, I don't always get it right, but I pray that as a church doesn't always get it right, that you will still use us as a beautiful illustration of God's love in this world. May we represent you well. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.